John me giving Bob Weeks a warm packet of club welcome. Well, thanks very much, everybody, for coming today. I'm really uh, grateful to see so many uh, people here. And uh, just remember one thing. If things don't go well today, blame John Todd. <laughs> but as we see, economic development incentives in Wichita, Kansas, an important topic. And um, uh, let's go right to it. But first, just a shameless plug for my website, The Voice for Liberty. That's at wichitaliberty.org. That's what it looks like. We also have a lot of the things I do there. One thing I do is these interactive visualizations. So these are uh, data that I've gathered from various sources applied into a program called Tableau Public and you can then access this and not only look at charts and everything but as you can see a lot of things you can do different views of data change the dates of the data choose industries you want to see all sorts of things like that so hope that you look at those we also do Wichita Liberty TV and for the past almost two years Carl Peter John's been helping me do that that's our weekly television show broadcast on Sundays but also online there at wichitaliberty.org there's a prominent link to it and you can see we do a pretty good job of getting some prominent guests there's a uh, Senator Coburn Senator Jim DeMint Ron Rickman the speaker of the Kansas House of Representatives and I think probably the most popular guest or at least the most frequent was Mike Pompeo and I think that interview you see there was his last interview before he was named CIA director. I, I think it is, I'm not sure, but anyway. So, moving to today's topic, incentives, what are they? Well, these economic development incentives are something of value given to a company for a couple different reasons. First of all, we want to recruit new companies to come to the Wichita metropolitan area. We want to help existing companies expand, or as is often the case today, prevent them from leaving or at least induce them uh, to leave. These incentives may be cash grants or more frequently other forms and often implemented via poorly understood programs which obfuscate or confuse us about what is actually happening at that time. Why do we need to use these incentives? Well politicians and bureaucrats say without incentives we can't compete, which is always a strange thing to me to hear them say that we, unless we dish out incentives, no one will come here. Or companies will leave to get incentives from other cities. And we see threats like this of all the time. Most recently, uh, the big one that's most recent well, it was Cargill. Uh, they were shopping around for a deal from another city to move to. And so Wichita says, we've got to use incentives or they're going to leave. Or, as is very often the case, companies cannot grow and expand here without incentives. That was the argument made recently with Spirit Aero Systems, that if we don't give incentives, Spirit won't grow here, they can't grow here, they're going to grow somewhere else. And always when we talk about these incentives, there's a couple things we need to uh, keep in mind, which is, are these incentives, and I say plural because very often, multiple incentives are used at the same time to lure or um, uh, prevent a company from leaving. So, but if they're not necessary, we're paying their cost unnecessarily. And if they're not necessary, we might be giving up future tax revenue <coughs> unnecessarily because a lot of incentive programs, as we'll see in just a moment, um, uh, give back future tax revenues to the company, we, a tax holiday. And if the incentives are necessary, we need to ask this question. Why is investment in an office building or a movie theater or um, an apartment building, why is it unprofitable unless we use incentives? So always ask the question, is the incentive necessary and why is it necessary? So looking at specific incentive programs, one of the most common one that's used is the Industrial Revenue Bond, or IRB. And this is one that's very confusing because it sounds like the city's lending money, but it's not. Uh, someone else lends the company the money. The city just authorizes or issues these bonds. 
So why do they do that? Well, we'll see that in just a moment. And companies, when they want IRBs, they apply to either a city or a county. Both uh, jurisdictions are able to, uh, to authorize and do the industrial revenue uh, process. So here we have kind of a diagram here. And I know there's a lot of things going on, but that's the way it is. But we might start out with the city here, which authorizes the IRBs and you see that in a headline city authorizes eight million dollars of IRBs for YMCA or whatever it might be the other thing the city dishes out at that time is a tax exemption and that is the real reason why uh, companies apply for and cities and counties give industrial revenue bonds the uh, tax exemption which is property tax and then oftentimes sales tax so here we have the IRBs which of course provide funds to the company who buys the IRBs? Well, sometimes the bank does, sometimes they're sold on the open market. Very frequently the applicant company purchases their own IRBs. That's the case with Spirit Aerosystems and many times. It's confusing. The industrial revenue bonds we see our Wichita Eagle or our business press, Wichita Business Journal all the time, have headlines like Wichita City Council to consider six million dollars in IRBs for whatever it is. When really the headline should be Wichita City Council to consider so much money in annual tax abatements because again, that is the reason for industrial revenue bonds because the government is not lending money and does not guarantee the credit. If you buy industrial revenue bonds and you don't get paid back, you have no recourse against the city of Wichita. Remember, often the applicant company buys the bonds itself. No property tax with the per with on property purchased with the bond proceeds, or sometimes the property tax rate is reduced. And then, often no sales tax on purchases. Uh, purchases made with the proceeds from the bond. So if a company is building something, then the building materials and things like that, they won't have to pay sa sales tax on that. And importantly, these things are justified by a benefit cost ratio. So let's talk about that. Oh, um, but before that, you know how the mayor says and the city says, we're not losing using cash incentives anymore because people rightly got kind of frustrated when they saw just cash grants made to companies for this or, or that. So the mayor politically sensed that people don't like that and he says, well, we're not going to use cash incentives anymore. But when you say you don't have to pay property taxes for 10 years on this piece of property, how's that any different from giving the equal amount of cash? I don't think it is. And that's why instead of just giving cash, government uses programs like this where there's a bond, which is really not a loan that concerns us. It concerns the people involved in the loan, but that's not the public. But the tax forgiveness is the actual incentive there. And again, we have to say, is this incentive necessary? If it is necessary, then why can't we invest without free taxes if it's not necessary to get the company to come here or to expand here or whatever? then why are we giving the incentive? Um, are industrial revenue bonds for industry only? You know, you think, oh, industrial revenue, it's for Spirit or Cessna or somebody like that. No, industrial revenue bonds. The Spaghetti Works over here has IRBs. There's a freestanding emergency department in Northeast Wichita doctor's office. Essentially, they got IRBs. The YMCA did. Uh, apartment buildings. It's not industrial anymore. Who pays the cost of these IRBs? Well, the answer is, here's a, a downtown property. Their tax rates taken right out of the Sedgwick County Treasurer page. And look, the biggest consumer of tax revenue is the school district typically. Notice that the state here collects 21 and a half mills, but really 20 mills of that goes back to the school district. So the school district really collects 53 mills out of 124 mills altogether. And the city of Wichita, by granting industrial revenue bonds, USD 259 gets none of that money anymore. The county, 
Commissioner Ranza, how do you feel when the city of Wichita grants an IRB and the county has to pay 23.6% of the cost of that? Don't answer, you don't have to answer that, that's it. Uh, so the city really is kind of a minor participant collecting just a little bit more than a quarter of the property tax that most uh, properties pay, yet they're the one who gets to say county, school district, and also uh, whatever other districts there might be, we're gonna redirect your property tax to some other uh, purpose. So property tax, but also sales tax. Very often, as a matter of fact, almost all the time, sales tax is forgiven as part of the IRBs, as we mentioned before. And when you think about who pays the sales tax and where does it go? Well, in Wichita, almost all the sales tax that's collected goes to the state of Kansas. As a matter of fact, 86.7% of it does, 5.6% of it goes to Sedgwick County, and 7.7% comes to the city through the sharing arrangement with Sedgwick County on the one cent per dollar. So the city of Wichita can take an action that costs the state a great deal of money. Now I mentioned that there's a benefit cost ratio. This is used to justify these incentives, particularly IRBs, from an economic perspective. And the claim is, is that by giving up that future tax revenue, the tax abatement, the government gets even more back in return. And in Wichita, the policy is that this benefit cost ratio must be 1.3 to 1 or better. In other words, if the Wichita city, uh, city government gives up a dollar of future tax revenue, it expects to get $1.3, a dollar thirty back or even more than that. That's the justification for these incentives very often. This benefit cost ratio, at least for the city of Wichita, is prepared by the Center for Economic Development and Business Research at Wichita State University using input data from the applicant company. And there's just a, they, the CED bar on, CEDBR on their website, they have a presentation that shows how they do all of this. But the important thing is that this analysis is based upon multipliers provided by the Bureau of Economic Analysis, which is part of the United States Department of Commerce. And it attempts to account for the impact of business operations on other business and also the payroll expenditures too. And we know how this works. You paid your $12 for your lunch today, but the back of the room closet doesn't get to keep that. We have to pay Kathy Latham, the manager here, and then she has to turn around and pay the suppliers of the food, her, pay, her um, employees. She has to pay rent to our landlord, Phil Ruffin here. He in turn gives it to Donald Trump, I think, mostly. But you know, that's the way business works. Money starts out and then it, it trickles its way through the economy. The multipliers are an, an, an effort to estimate that a dollar spent by Spirit Aero Systems ends up generating so much else in um, economic activity. We call those the indirect and induced impacts of the original uh, economic event. Now, to the input data, remember I said is provided by the applicant company to Wichita State University. And here's an example of questions they have to answer. It says, uh, related to this project, the expansion, the um, a new company coming in, whatever it may be, what are new or additional sales of the firm related to this project? And since IRB tax abatements last for 10 years, you have to do that for years one through 10. and what percent of these new sales are subject to sales taxes in the city, county, and state? Well, these are almost impossible questions to answer. How do we know what sales are gonna be in my company eight years from now? And what percent of those are gonna be taxable by the county and not the city? And it's just really almost impossible type of questions to answer. And that's not it, there's more questions. All of these questions here, and just to give an example of how remarkable some of these are, you need to estimate for years one through 10, the number of new employees moving to Sedgwick County each year from other counties in Kansas. So can you imagine business executives saying around, yeah, in year eight, we're gonna, uh, we're gonna recruit some from Hayes, so uh, yeah, in Dodge City, they'll count, but the ones from Oklahoma City, we you just can't answer a lot of these questions. 
which reminds me of the joke that economists use a decimal point now and then to show that they have a sense of humor. <laughs> You just cannot, I don't see how any companies can have, I mean, maybe a big company like Spirit Aerosystems with the fleets of economists and business analysts, they might be able to do uh, to provide reasonable answers to those questions, unless there's some sort of huge intervening event, like, let's say, the terrorist attacks of 9-11, which, um, you know, depressed airplane sales for a long time. So, economic activity, multipliers account for this flow of economic activity, and it's real. It happens for everything, whether incentivized or not. And that's the important thing. Is the incentive necessary? If not, why are we paying for it? Because this economic activity is going to happen anyway. So you think about all the unincentivized projects in Wichita that happen. What's the benefit cost ratio for those? Well, the answer is infinite because the city doesn't have to give up anything in subsidies, yet we get the benefits. And then, well, what exactly are these benefits? Well, to government, the benefit is more tax revenue coming in. Remember the benefit cost ratio. We give up a dollar in tax revenue next year, we expect to get a dollar thirty or more back. Um, so that's a good investment for them. But is more taxes going to government, is that a benefit for you? All those who think that government spends more wisely than the private sector, please stand up. <laughs> I remember, uh, oh Mark, you, uh, I remember when I was in college studying physics or something, the professor asked a tough question of the class and no one had an answer, so he was kind of frustrated. He said, all of you in this class who are total morons, please stand up. Well, I looked around, no one stood up, so after a moment I stood up. And the professor said, so are you a complete and total moron? And I said, no, but... Uh, I just didn't like to see you standing up there by yourself. Oh. So, more tax revenue going to government is, I don't know if that's really a good thing. But here's the other thing. When you're a politician or a bureaucrat, the more jobs that companies create, the better. You can say, I created a thousand jobs with this spirit aerosystem thing, but what about the business? To a business, jobs are a cost to be minimized. I mean, don't think very many business people just go hiring people just for the heck of it. They do it because they need them, but they don't need a lot. I mean, they want to minimize uh, the cost of having jobs. And then there's another issue of accountability with these IRBs because the city says, you know, that cost-benefit analysis, that's WSU, Center for Economic Development and Business Research, that does this analysis for that. And Wichita State says, well, we just use the data that the company supplies us and plug it into this computer model and out comes the numbers. Um, accountability is avoided, absolutely. There's another type of incentive that's commonly used, and that's tax increment financing, or TIF. What this does is it takes, uh, as, as a project gets developed, and oftentimes with TIF, you're starting out with a vacant lot or a run-down, blighted building or something that has very little economic value and therefore pays a low amount of property taxes. Well, so we build a building on that, we renovate the old dilapidated building into something new, we create more economic value, eventually the appraiser notices and raises up the taxable assessed value, and that means the, the uh, development has to start paying a lot more property tax. Well, that future increase in property taxes is called the increment, and that's what tax increment finance, financing captures. It captures that incremental tax revenue and reroutes it away from its normal flow. Cities or counties in Kansas can initiate uh, TIF districts. So before a TIF district is formed, we have an undeveloped project or property and it's paying taxes that go to the city, county, school district, state, cemetery district, you know, there could be other types of districts. And remember, it's an undeveloped project, so it's probably not paying very much property tax at all. Whatever that level is, we call that the base. Then we form the TIF district, the city does typically. And what the city does is to borrow money by issuing bonds. Those are the TIF bonds. 
and the proceeds of those bonds are transferred to the development or spent in some other way that benefits that development. For example, a TIF district that's pretty new is the, um, well now they call it the Spaghetti Works District over here, but uh, a TIF district is being formulated and used to provide revenue to well, I say destroy, but other people say renovate Nasker Park into, into something nicer. So after the formation of the TIF, TIF district, now we have a developed project, remember, that's more valuable than the old vacant lot or blighted building or whatever it is. The base taxes, again, that's the low level of taxes because the building was blighted. They get distributed as before, city, county, school, district, state, and whatever. But the incremental taxes, which is where the real money is, goes to the state of Kansas, some of it, but also to repay the bonds that the city issued in order to benefit the applicant uh, uh, project. Remember the base tax, usually small, incremental tax, really big, and this can go on for 22 years or so. Well, state. The state statutes exempt the state share of property tax from being rerouted like uh, city, county, and school district taxes are. So when we develop a project outside of a TIF district, all the taxes from the new development, which will probably be a lot, get distributed to city, county, school district, and the state. But when we have development within a TIF district, the incremental taxes are rerouted back to the project and also to the state of Kansas. The city, county, and school district give up their anticipated tax revenue in order to have the TIF district. So is a TIF district necessary? Again, that's always the question uh, we want to answer. And if it's not needed, then why are we doing it, of course? And it used to be with TIF districts that there was always this but-for criteria, and it's still around today, which is to say, we cannot have this renovated office building, we cannot have this grocery store at Pawnee and George Washington Boulevard unless there is the TIF district. And that's the standard argument that politicians and bureaucrats typically make. Because citizens may say, well, why do we give up all this future tax revenue uh, so we can have this grocery store or whatever it is? Well, the politicians come back and say, well, if we don't agree to do this, there's not going to be a grocery store there. There's not going to be a renovated office building or hotel. So it doesn't really cost us anything. But we have examples where that grocery store at uh, Pawnee and George Washington Boulevard, the developer said, there's no way, what did he say, John? I mean, no way we can build a grocery store there unless we have a TIF district. But the county disapproved participation in the TIF district, so there is no TIF district there, but there is a grocery store. Another developer came in and found a way to do it without the TIF district. Originally, TIF was um, uh, proposed to correct blight. So you have a rundown office building that's blighted. TIF can help perhaps provide the funds necessary uh, to renovate it. But that grocery store on Pawnee was an empty lot, which is hard to see blight. A lot of the times, people, politicians will say, well, TIF is paying just for infrastructure, like streets and sewers and so forth like that. But you know, private sector developers oftentimes have to pay for that themselves. An, an outstanding example is the waterfront project at 13th and um, Webb Road. A lot of you know Johnny Stevens or Steve Clark, the, the uh, principals in that. There's a nice road called Waterfront Parkway that runs from Webb Road to 13th. It winds around. It's beautifully landscaped. Uh, it's just a beautiful road. Well, they spent about $1.5 million building that road, and then after they built it, they deeded it over to the city. So when people say, well, these TIF bonds are just paying for infrastructure that the city does anyway, no, that's not true. Uh, in many cases, it's not. There's also this ruse about allowable expenses. When you look at the TIF statute, the, uh, the money can be used for this, but it can't be used for that. It can be used for this, but not for that. 
But really, these are just ways to provide cover. For example, if I, uh, I gave you a $100 bill with the stipulation that you could spend it only on Monday or Wednesday, would you deny that I'd enriched you by $100? I mean, there's a few conditions there that aren't really helpful, but still, I've given you $100. And these allowable expense categories are still pretty much the same. And the other thing that we that politicians often say when they just justify TIF is, well, the developers are still paying their taxes. And that's right. As the property tax goes up, the developers have to pay all of that, just like if it was in a non-TIF district. But where does that money in a TIF district go to? Well, it goes back to benefit the development and not to pay for the general cost of government. There is a wrinkle on this in that we now have what's called a pay-as-you-go TIF. The difference here is that instead of the city um, borrowing a bunch of money, giving it to the development, and then paying it back over 20 years or some period of time, the pay-as-you-go TIF is simply as property tax incremental revenue is paid, it's given back to the development. So why even pay it in the first place, I guess? Well, the answer is all of this is kind of confusing, and government likes that because it really kind of hides the actual economic transactions uh, that are going on. Now, another popular... Um, uh, incentive program that's available in Wichita and throughout Kansas and through a lot of the country as well. We call it a community <laughs> improvement district uh, in, in Kansas is what we do. And this is where in a geographic district the landowners agree to have merchants charge extra sales tax. And this extra sales tax can be up to another two cents per dollar. It could be one cent or half a cent or some fraction, but it could be an additional two cents uh, per dollar. There are these CIDs all over downtown and all over Wichita as well. Um, and the extra CID tax then is rerouted to benefit the development. You apply to either the city or the county to get this process going. So when a CID uh, district is formed, typically what the city does, I don't want to say typically because there's two types here, but the city borrows money by issuing bonds, the CID bonds, then that pr money is transferred to the development or spent in some way for the development's benefit and we have then a developed project, we hope. Although there are some, in some cases where the city has authorized a community improvement district but nothing has happened even after several years. So after the formation of a community improvement district, here's a merchant that's located within a CID. The, the sales tax that's collected there, the regular sales tax, 7.5, I'm sorry, I said seven, maybe this is an old, well, seven and a half it is now, goes to the state of Kansas like normal although in Wichita one cent goes to Sedgwick County to be split up, but the regular sales tax goes like it normally does, but the additional CID tax, again up to an extra two cents per dollar, goes to pay off the CID bonds over a period of up to 20 or 22 years, I think it is. So, um, there is also a pay-as-you-go CID, which is kind of like the pay-as-you-go TIF. The city does not borrow money. Simply as the additional CID tax is collected quarterly or some periodic time, it just goes back to the landlord. The city or the state collects uh, maybe five, two or five percent or something for an administrative fee, but all that extra sales tax just goes right back to the landlords. Not the merchants, but the landlords. And that's important because when I talked about CIDs a few years ago to some legislators, they were surprised that it was landlords that initiate and benefit and not the merchants. I'm sorry. Another thing that the city of Wichita has done recently f as an incentive is regulatory relief. And this is what they did for Cargill uh, as just one of many layers of subsidy. They 
gave expedited plan review, which the city estimated would result in a 50% reduction in the time to get your building permit approved or things like that, and then reduced permitting fees, cut those in half, the city estimated that Cargill would save $85,000 this way. What's really interesting was a city economic development official was quoted in the Wichita Eagle as saying, well, basically, we wanted to help Cargill get through the labyrinth of city processes. <laughs> I just don't know how to respond to that at all. I mean, a big company like Cargill has lawyers and accountants and all sorts of people who can help get through a regulatory labyrinth. But think about the little small businesses, the young businesses. They don't have those lawyers and delay for them is very costly and so are fees as well. Another program, and this is one that's uh, really a state program, not a local program, is called PEAK, Promoting Employment Across Kansas, or as some people say, paying taxes to the boss. Because what PEAK does is it allows companies that are in the PEAK program to retain 95% of the employees' state withholding taxes. So, you know, you look on your paycheck, there's so much withholded um, in state income taxes. Well, the company gets 95% of that, the rest of it uh, is kept by the uh, state as a, uh, uh, a, f a fee for doing this, this program. So the normal flow of taxes is a company collects withholding taxes from its employees, sends them to the state. Under peak, the company collects the same dollars in withholding taxes, but 5% goes to state, 95% back paying taxes to the boss. And for a company like Spirit that's hiring, let's say, another thousand new people at uh, pretty good rates, uh, that's uh, a lot of money. Matter of fact, Peak is very valuable to companies that qualify. You combine Peak with another tax program that the state of Kansas has, the HPIP. Remember a couple years ago, I asked uh, the Secretary of Revenue, Jordan, if what he said at one time was actually true, that Governor Brownback went to corporations in Kansas, and we're not talking about LLCs, we're talking about uh, corporations that pay corporation tax, and said, we'll cancel, we'll have 0% tax, income tax on corporations if you give up PEAK and HPIP and, and other programs. And the corporation said, we want the, pro, the tax credit programs instead of 0% income tax. That's how valuable these things are. So peak very valuable. And what would happen if personal income tax rates are cut in a couple years? Well, what would happen to the withholding taxes that Spirit collects from its employees? They'd go down. Spirit gets much less back. So. What's the incentive there? There's also little transparency here. Trying to get information from the Department of Commerce about this program is very difficult. And then also, there's an incentive, a perverse incentive. I don't know if it actually takes place, but um, it has to do with the incentive to hire what type of employee, because someone at Spirit earns $50,000 a year. How much tax is withheld from a single employee versus a married employee with like five children. Single gets a lot more tax withheld and that's what Spirit gets 95% of. So is there an incentive to hire based upon that type of factor? It seems like there is. I'm not saying they do it, but it seems like they very well could be. The HPIP program, again, another state program, 10% income tax credit on eligible capital investments. So when a company buys expensive machinery and equipment, they get 10% of that back from the state. And there I say it again, for corporations in Kansas, peak and HPIP are more valuable to them than a zero income tax rate. Star bonds. This is another incremental program like TIF, but TIF looks at property taxes capturing the increment there. Star bonds sales tax capture the incremental sales tax there, which is rerouted back to benefit the development.
Now, in some cases, all the sales tax is captured. You know, in Wichita, on Greenwich Road, north of K96, and actually south of K96 as well, but especially north of K96, there's the big development with Bed Bath Beyond and a, a lot of stores like that. Well, those are in a star bonds district. So the incremental sales tax captured there goes back to benefit the development instead of the state of Kansas. And the key there is that on the day that the base sales tax was figured, there was nothing there. So all the sales tax that those stores generate is incremental. The Target store at 21st and Greenwich Road is also in that Star Bonds district, but it was already there and had been there for a while uh, when the Star Bonds district started. So its base sales tax is pretty high. Hopefully they're going up a little bit, but just, uh, you know, that increment is small compared to something that was not there at all. Star Bonds, you apply to a city or county, and then the Kansas Department of Commerce, the Secretary of Commerce, has to approve those. So here we have a city or county borrows money by issuing star bonds. These proceeds are again transferred to the development or spent in a way that benefits the development. So after formation of the star bonds district, um, there is the base sales tax that goes to the state and the county and city, whatever it may do, but the incremental sales tax goes to pay, uh, pay back the star bonds. So who pays for star bonds? Well, since nearly all sales tax goes to the state, when the city of Wichita creates a star bonds district, as it has for the uh, North Greenwich Road, as it has for uh, in Delano and the new baseball stadium, almost all of that sales tax that's collected um, would have gone to the state, smaller amounts to the uh, county and the city. So why wouldn't the city be interested in doing this type of thing? Because the city has to give up just a minuscule amount of sales tax. The state gives up quite a bit. And I think that's the reason why there's been in Topeka, the legislature's taken a look at star bonds and wanting to know if uh, this is something we should continue to do. There's a couple other smaller programs. One is historic preservation tax credits where if you have an historic building, you can get back money to renovate it. So the Spaghetti Works building over here is on the is getting Kansas historic preservation tax cuts. So they're getting back 25%. And if they can also get on the federal register, they get 20% 20, uh, 20 back as well. The Colorado Derby building at so that was the school administrating building. That's at second and first and, well, you know where it is. A very unremarkable turn of the century um, office building, but no, all of a sudden it was a historic treasure eligible for these tax credits. And a tax credit, as you know, is not like a deduction. You get to take off your income. A tax credit is taking dollars off the taxes that you actually owe. And usually these tax credits are transferable, meaning if I don't need them or if I want the money now, I sell them. Might have to only get 90 cents of their value uh, of every dollar, but you can still do that. Well, here's a new one that the city of Wichita has dreamed up. Uh, remember the mayor and everybody says we're not going to give cash to these companies anymore so let's buy an easement how about that and the first one that I'm aware of is for Cargill right over here where the city is going to pay an easement to be able to use the parking garage so it's not really renting it's an <coughs> easement and so the city has worked up an easement, it's 15 years long, where the city can use the garage in the evenings and on weekends, when Cargill isn't using it, presumably. And the city paid six and a half million dollars to Cargill for this. Now, I don't know, is there a lot of need for a parking garage there in the evening and so forth? You know, it's right across from Old Town, but I don't know, I don't hear people complaining there's no parking in Old Town uh, very often. So we are paying this easement for something that's really not useful to the city. Is that like giving cash? I don't know. I mean, it was thought originally that the city would simply build a garage for Cargill, but that would be seen as giving cash so that we did this instead. Now what's interesting is, look at the amounts of money here. For the amount of parking spaces the city is gaining access to for 15 years, 
$9,286 for each of those spaces. Now, a couple years ago, you know that the city rehabilitated the garage at 215 uh, South Market at about $17,600 per parking space. And the city rents out stalls in that garage for $35 a month to nearby companies, $420 per year. But for Cargill, the city is paying $619 per year simply to be able to use those parking spots in off hours. And do you think the city will let us park there for free? <laughs> they haven't said. Well, there's some more c comparisons there, but forgivable loans not used very much anymore. I'd probably not going to be used much anymore. Uh, where that was a program where the city simply gave cash up front and if conditions like employment goals and so forth were met, the city or the county would cancel the loan. Now, I've talked about cash incentives from time to time that how they had really a poor, they were distasteful to taxpayers. So the city of Wichita and the mayor say, no cash. We do not use cash incentives anymore. But here's the exact language in the ag agreement with Spirit of Assistance from 2017. City cash, $3 million cash. And you remember the purple pipe water project where Spirit would, um, uh, the city built a system where um, treated water from the sewer plant would be used for industrial purposes at Spirit? Spirit was supposed to pay back the city for that, but the city decided to forgive three and a half million dollars of that debt. Now the mayor says, oh, that's not cash. We just forgave debt. <laughs> There's some other things. Most of these are very minor, not used much at all, don't account for much money. But here's the last thing I'll, I'll mention before I think we'll take a few questions in the time we have. How do you learn about all these incentives? Well, you may remember during the 2014 sales tax campaign for a Wichita City sales tax, that part of that, the second largest part, was going to be a jobs fund to provide incentives. We were promised that there'd be reporting on these incentives. There would be a website with reports posted outlining expenditures and outcomes and so forth. Well, that was used as a lure, a bribe, to get us to vote for that sales tax to provide these incentives. But this is the type of stuff that the city should be doing anyway. And matter of fact, here's the city of Lawrence, Kansas, uh, you know, just a quarter of the size of Wichita. Every year they have an economic development report. It's lengthy. Here's an example of a table showing all sorts of figures related to the economic development incentives uh, that they've used. So. Here's an example of some of the world's shortest books, different ways to spell Bob, and also <laughs> annual report on incentives by the city of Wichita. They just don't do it. Now there is some information in the budget, some information in the comprehensive annual financial report, but nothing that really lets us know, are we getting a return on investment for the incentives that we've uh, given up? And um, you know, Three years ago, the city expanded its communication staff, adding a new person, uh, Ken Evans, who um, is now like assistant city manager for strategic, strategic communications. Easy for him to say, hope, I hope. Uh, unfortunately, he's been sick, okay? So maybe not working all the time, but you know, someone else could do this job too. Um, they just don't report this to us. You know, City of Wichita doesn't even provide checking, reg check register spending data like almost every other government in the country does. Each year I ask for that data, sometimes I have to pay for it, and then I post it on my website in the visualizations where you can sort it and aggregate it and select it and do some analysis like that. That's something the city's promised me for years, five or six years, that we're going to have a financial system that does that someday, but we don't have that. So um, I'm going to uh, stop right there because we're almost out of time. There's a whole other part of this presentation I knew I wouldn't have time for, but is what is all the policy implications of this um, and some issues that we really need to grapple with regarding the use of economic development incentives in Wichita. So Carl, you've got the microphone? 
No, but no. Gary does. Okay, Gary. <laughs> At least five minutes. Away. Okay, Bob. The uh, how many parking slots are at Cargill? Because uh, I think they got by with that because of the interest arena. Uh, severe shortage of parking. They have all those events to you know to use that. Well, I think at Cargill it's about 700 or something like that, but <clears throat> I'm not aware of a parking shortage for Interest Bank Arena. They have big sellout events there all the time and have for 10 years or however long it's been. Might be a little bit more convenient to have those spaces there, but uh, how many sellout events are there each year at Interest Bank Arena? Of course, you still don't have to sell, sell out. I mean, you have to park a long ways away mm -hmm. and sell whatever. This really is a question since you frequently have all the answers, but I want to say thank you for all the work you do and the information that you put out there. You're welcome, thank you. Thank you, I think I said yes. Have you coordinated campaign contributions with incentives granted? <laughs> The research on that shows there's not a very strong linkage between campaign contributions and the use of incentives. There is some, and of course some people allege that there's corruption, that office holders, bureaucrats are receiving money illegally from the people who get the incentives. I know that happens in some places. I don't think it happens around here. But what does happen is that politicians use incentives for their own self-preservation to get elected because the mayor can say we got spirit to expand here because of these incentives do we know whether those incentives were necessary well commissioner ranza told me he asked the economic development official can you tell me that without these incentives spirit would not have expanded here and the man said no so do we know whether these incentives are necessary or not no one has an incentive to tell. Can you imagine the president of the Spirit Aero System saying, well, we don't really need these incentives, but thank you, we'll take them anyway. No, taxpayers would revolt at that. And can you imagine the mayor or the city manager saying, um, Spirit's going to uh, expand here anyway, but we're going to go ahead and give him millions of dollars in incentives. No, mayor is not going to say that, but they'll take credit for it and whether the incentives are successful in luring or retaining a company or not, the politicians still win. Because if a company does come here or expand here, they say they did it because of the incentives that I rammed through the city council or whatever like that. What happens if the incentive is not successful in the sense that uh, Spirit expanded somewhere else rather than in Wichita? The mayors can say, well, we tried. We offered them a ton of money. But we need more incentives so that we are better prepared to compete next time. So it's a win-win situation for uh, politicians either way. That's why there's a new book I have called by Nathan Jensen. I think some of you have seen him, but he's a um, professor of government, I think is his exact title, at the University of Texas in Austin. And the new book this year he co-wrote, authored, is titled Pandering for Incentives, Why Politicians Use uh, These Incentives. James? Yeah, you know, I understand it's hard to tell the correlation, but like in Coffinville, they had three companies that got 10 years of incentives, and as soon as the 10 years was up, they all left. So apparently the incentives brought them to town, but it wasn't enough to keep them. They got incentives from somewhere else. I just wonder if and there's no good way to tell it, I guess. Did that 10 years really benefit Coffeeville to have those three companies there for what it cost them? Yeah, those types of questions are very hard to answer. You know, the peak uh, thing, the you know, the withholding of the uh, the employees withholding taxes. Missouri has a similar system, and you've probably read about the border war, where you have Kansas City with a state um, boundary going right down the middle. There have been some companies like Applebee's that, I forget which happened first, they moved across the line for a bunch of incentives. They moved back across the line a few years later for a bunch more incentives. Then they moved to California. <laughs> that was partly because Applebee's got purchased by another company or something, but yeah.
Bob, I was really interested in this uh, acronym PEAK and, and the amount of money that that could be is just astounding to me. How many uh, employees do we have in the state of Kansas that are getting that? And are the employees themselves even aware uh, that their employment taxes are you know, 5% shaved off going to the state and 95% going right back to their employer? Is, is there some kind of a list where companies can look and compare, or is this just going to people that happen to be in the know uh, and, and others, you know, maybe that deserve it, uh, aren't getting well, <clears throat> first of all, there are uh, firms, nationwide firms, that specialize in helping companies um, mine the incentive landfill. Um, an example is the law firm Polsonelli Shugart in Overland Park. I think they're nationwide. But they wrote the community, community Improvement District Law in Kansas and got that passed through the legislature. And I think that almost every successful Community Improvement District in Wichita Polson Ellie Shugart has been the consultant that helps the company navigate the labyrinth of Wichita City Hall and to get this project approved. You know, there's research, Mark, that shows that how important are incentives? Well, some surveys have shown that even executives of the companies that receive incentives are not aware of their company's participation. So how would employees know that either, unless you pay real close attention to things and read the newspaper? And uh, you know, the Wichita City Council, when it, um, and also Sedgwick County, I believe, when they approved the deal with Spirit, they talked about their own participation in it. But Peak is not the city or the county, it's a state program. You apply to the Department of Commerce, there's a lot of qualifications you have to meet, and then there's also the discretion of the secretary you have to pass as well. Um, so the city doesn't even, they used to say in their agenda materials that this company is also applying for peak from the <coughs> state of Kansas, but they don't say that anymore. Because um, when you add these incentive programs up, they can, I'm sorry, Carl, they can, you know, they can be huge. And the city wants to say, you know, we gave Spirit $3 million and got 1,000 jobs. Well, no. The city did, the county did, the state gave P. There's a lot of stuff going on there. Carl? Uh, final question to throw out. How does Kansas compare to the rest of the country in general and our surrounding states in particular in terms of do we have more incentives than these other states, about the same or fewer? Well, that's a really hard question to answer, Carl, about how Kansas and Wichita and other cities compare. The lore around Wichita is, is that we don't have very much to give in incentives. Uh, uh, you hear that all the time. That, uh, we need more incentives so we can compete more vigorously. But a lot of these incentives come from the state of Kansas and the city kind of ignores them because, you know, they don't want to really confess up as to how much incentives a lot of companies are, um, are getting. A lot of states have peak or similar type of programs where the employee withholding taxes is retained by the company. Um, and TIF districts are ubiquitous across the country. Uh, the committee improvement district, the extra sales tax and the star bonds, <coughs> many states have those. So I would say Kansas is not really distinctive from other states in the uh, type of things. It is true that some states are very aggressive with cash grants. Texas is, I believe, and we're at least out of the cash grant business, according to the mayor and so forth, although most of this other stuff is as good as cash. So thank you, Carl. I'm going to ask the uh, two-fold well, question. Oh, no. Does it make sense uh, for uh, Park City, down there, Goddard, and Wichita, to use IRBs to compete for the same businesses, so the tax abatements? Well, you know, we're supposed question, to. The second question is: uh, Are these? This this is all part of state law, so the legislature plays a role in this. So, if we want to see reform, maybe this is something that the state legislature should look at. Well, as far as the different. Um, small cities in the Wichita metropolitan area competing, you know, now the focus is supposed to be on regional economic growth. So if it happens in Park City or Andover, it's all in our region. So 
why should it matter? But uh, the mayor of Park City and the mayor of Wichita probably don't see things that way. They want to take credit for what they think they are responsible for. And yes, John, all of these pro uh, programs, I don't, maybe I shouldn't say all, but uh, things like TIF, star bonds, um, those are, there are Kansas statutes that regulate these. Um, and so the legislature, yeah, is responsible for this. Should the legislature reform some of these things? Well, I think that we should. And again, the question is, are these incentives necessary? Are they really a net economic benefit to the regions that use them? The set qu answer to the first question is, we really don't know. There's little incentive for anybody to be truthful. The answer to the second question, do these incentives work and produce broad prosperity? They work because you see the new spirit building. It was on the front page of the newspaper yesterday. But as far as producing economic growth as a whole, the economic research is nearly conclusive, and the answer is no. Thank you, John. Thank you.